Eruvin 60A. I'll start up here. The floor above the ground floor, who forgot and did not establish a joint eruv. If there is a partition four hand breaths wide in front of the entrance to the balcony, the balcony does not prohibit the residents of the courtyard from carrying, as each area is considered to be independent. And if not, the balcony prohibits the residents of the courtyard from carrying in the courtyard. This indicates that a ladder between two courtyards is always considered an entrance, even when that policy leads to a stringent ruling unless the two areas are separated by a partition. The Gemra answers, With what are we dealing here? With a case where the balcony is not ten handbreaths high from the ground. Consequently, it does not constitute a domain in its own right, and it is part of the courtyard. The Gemra asks, If the balcony is not ten handbreaths high, and is therefore part of the courtyard, when one places a partition, what of it? The balcony should nevertheless be considered part of the courtyard. The Gemra answers, We are dealing here with a balcony that is entirely fenced off, except for a section up to ten cubits wide, which serves as an entrance. In that case, since the residents of the balcony place a partition at this entrance, they thereby remove themselves entirely from the courtyard. Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said, with regard to a wall that one lined with ladders, even along a length of more than ten cubits, it still retains the status of a partition. The ladders do not constitute an opening that is more than ten cubits wide, which would cause the wall to be regarded as breached and would invalidate the wall as a partition. Rab Baruna raised a contradiction to Rav Yehuda in the wine press at Rav Hanina's house. Did Shmuel actually say that such a wall has the status of a partition. Didn't Rav Naaman say that Shmuel said, with regard to the residents of a balcony and the residents of a courtyard who forgot and did not establish a joint eruv, if there is a partition four hand breasts wide in front of the entrance to the balcony, the balcony does not prohibit the residents of the courtyard to carry and if not, it prohibits the residents of the courtyard from carrying. This indicates that a ladder is considered an entrance, as the courtyard and the balcony are considered connected. Rav Yehuda replied in the same manner as above, With what are we dealing here? We are dealing with a case where the balcony is not ten handbreaths high and that is why it is regarded as connected to the courtyard. The Gemra asks, If the balcony is not ten handbreaths high, when he places a partition, what of it? The balcony should nevertheless be considered part of the courtyard. The Gemra answers, We are dealing here with a balcony that is entirely fenced off, except for a section up to ten cubits wide which serves as an entrance. In that case, since the residents of the balcony place a partition at this entrance, they hereby remove themselves entirely from the courtyard. The Gemra relates that certain residents of the city of Kakuna, Kakunia came before Rav Yosef and said to him, Provide us with someone who will establish an Iru for our city. The city had originally been a public city and had turned into a private one, requiring that part of the city be excluded from the Eruv. Rav Yosef said to Abay, Go, establish an Eruv for them, and see to it that there is no outcry against it in the study hall. 
i.e. make sure the Eruv is valid beyond any doubt. He went and saw that certain houses opened to the river and not to the city. He said, let these houses serve as the section excluded from the Eruv for the city. Abay subsequently retracted and said, This cannot be done. As we learned in the Mishnah, one may not establish an Eruv for all of it. By inference, if they wanted to establish an Eruv for the entire city, they would have been able to establish such an Eruv, if not for the requirement to exclude a section of the city from the Eruv. However, these houses, which do not open to the city, could not have joined in an Eruv with the rest of the city in any case, and therefore they cannot serve as the excluded section. Rather, I will create windows for them between the courtyards of their houses and the rest of the city, so that if they want to establish an Eruv with the rest of the city by way of the windows, they can establish such an Eruv, and then these houses will be fit to serve as the excluded section. He subsequently retracted again and said, This is not necessary, as Rabbi Bar Avu established an Eruv for the entire city of Mehoza, which was a public city that had become a private one, neighborhood by neighborhood, due to the fact that the neighborhoods were separated by ditches from which the cattle would feed. In other words, Rabbi Bar Avu established a separate Eruv for each neighborhood without excluding any of them, as he maintained that each one was an excluded section for the other, and although the neighborhoods would not have been able to establish an Eruv together even if they wanted to, due to the ditches separating them, the neighborhoods were still able to serve as excluded areas for each other. He subsequently retracted once again and said, The two cases are not really comparable. There, in Mahosa, if they wanted, they could have established a single Eruv by way of the roofs. But these houses cannot establish an Eruv with the other houses of the city and therefore we must create windows for them. He subsequently retracted yet again and said, Windows are also not necessary, as that storehouse of straw which belonged to Marbar Pofidata from Pumbedida was designated as the section excluded from the Eruv arranged for the city of Pumbedida which proves that it is not necessary for the excluded section to be one that could have been included in an Eruv with the rest of the city. Abay said to himself, This is what the master meant when he said to me, See to it that there is no outcry against it in the study hall. Abay now understood the many factors that had to be considered and how wary one must be of reaching a hasty conclusion. The Mishnah stated that if a public city becomes a private city, one may not establish an Eruv for all of it unless he maintains an area outside the Eruv, which is like the size of the city of Hadasha in Judea. It was taught in a Bereta that Rabbi Yehuda said, there was a certain city in Judea, and its name was Hadasha, and it had fifty residents, including men, women, and children. And the sages would use it to measure the size of the section that must be excluded from an Eruv, and it itself was the excluded section of the Eruv of a larger city that was adjacent to it. A dilemma was raised before the sages. As for Hadasha, what is the Halakha? Is it permissible to establish an Eruv 
for Hadassah itself without excluding a section of the city from the Eruv. The Gemra answers, with regard to Hadassah, just, it is, just as it was the excluded section of the larger city, the larger city was also the excluded section of the smaller city. Rather, the question pertains to a small city, like Hadasha, that stands by itself, not in proximity to a larger city. What is the halakha? Does a small city require an excluded section or not? Rav Huna and Rav Yehuda disagreed about this issue. One said it requires an excluded section, and one said it does not require an excluded section. It is stated in the Mishnah that Rabbi Shimon says, the excluded area must be large enough to include at least three courtyards with two houses each. Rav Hama Bar Gurya said that Rav said, the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. However, Rabbi Yitzhak said, even one house and one courtyard suffice. The Gemara expresses surprise at the wording of this statement. Can it enter your mind that one courtyard, even without a house, is sufficient? Rather, correct it and say as follows. One house in one courtyard. Abay said to Rav Yosef, Is that ruling of Rabbi Yitzhak based on oral tradition or his own logic? Rav Yosef said to him, What practical difference does Rabbi Yitzhak's source make to us? Abay said to him, Quoting a well-known adage, When you study Talmud, is it merely a song? Is the material you study like the lyrics of a song that you do not understand? It is proper to investigate all aspects of the statements of the sages regardless of the practical ramifications. Mishnah One who was to the east of his home when Shabbat began and he had said to his son before Shabbat, Establish an Eruv for me to the west. Or if he was to the west of his home, and he had said to his son, Establish an Eruv for, for me to the east, the halakha is as follows. If there is a distance of 2,000 cubits from his current location to his house, and the distance to his Eruv is greater than this, he is permitted to walk to his house, and from there he may walk 2,000 cubits in every direction, but it is prohibited for him to walk to the spot where his son had deposited his eruv. If the distance from one's current location to his eruv is 2,000 cubits, and the distance to his house is greater than this, he is prohibited from walking to his house and he is permitted to walk to the spot of his eruv, and from there he may walk 2,000 cubits in every direction. In other words, with regard to the Shabbat limit, one's place of residence for Shabbat cannot be more than 2,000 cubits from his physical location when Shabbat begins. One who places his eruv in the outskirts of the city, i.e., within an area of slightly more than 70 cubits surrounding the city, it is as though he has not done anything. The 2,000 cubits of one Shabbat limit are measured from the edge of the outskirts of the city, even if there is no eruv, and one therefore gains nothing from placing an eruv within this area. If, however, he placed his Eruv outside the city's boundary, even if he placed it only one cubit beyond the city, in the next section, what he gains in distance through his Eruv on one side of the city, he loses on the other side.